of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Munns. I am currently the Director of Marketing and Multimedia for a law firm downtown. My history in internet marketing is pretty extensive. I've been doing it now for about eight years. I started off with a company in California called Reach Local. Some of you guys who are in marketing may recognize that name. They focus on PPC and they started to branch out in a couple other things. But when I worked there, I did a lot of PPC campaigns with them. PPC is a, a word we're going to start to use. You're going to hear it more. I don't know what the degree of breadth of the experience in the room is. So I'm going to explain a couple things. And if it sounds condescending, it's not really me, or it might be. But uh, I'm just going to make sure everyone understands what we're talking about. PPC is pay-per-click advertising, utilized in AdWords. I think Bing's got a version of it. And if you use Bing, then you're getting Yahoo. So there's a couple different platforms that focus on pay-per-click advertising. After I left uh, with Reach Local and doing pay-per-click, I started working for a firm here in Pittsburgh called Higher Images. It was a fresh company, a lot of new ideas, and it really gave me the ability to get creative with marketing and really embrace what was going on. And the funny part about that is the minute you embrace one avenue or one part of internet marketing, it changes, and what you learned was old, and you need to learn something new again. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, after I left Higher Images, I started to go back to school. And I really didn't find something I was looking for. I was working in a couple labs doing some pharmacy work, but currently I got sucked into internet marketing again because it's more of a passion and a challenge than it is really a job for me. So when I go to work each day, I don't go to work. I get up to go tackle a challenge, put out a fire, and have a lot of fun. Because I heard it mentioned earlier, when you when you go to your to your social job and your social media job, and that's what you do for a living, it's not a job, it's actually part of you because you're part of that social aspect of it. Your, your personal brand is what helps people to accept you and, and want to utilize you for whatever tool they need you to be. And I think that's a good segue into how I'm going to have the session run today is about your tools. I mean, this is about our digital toolboxes. And a company who needs an internet marketer needs a lot more than just somebody who wears that hat and that title. And you need to be a web developer, you need to be an advertiser, you need to be marketing, you need to be public relations, you need to be damage control. You better know how to fix a printer when it breaks. And uh, copy or two for that matter. So in, in all, there's a lot of different aspects when you work in this day and age, 2012, in October, on online advertising for a company. And I understand that some of us have blogs out there that we're looking to get our, our, our presence known and, and get our information out there. So I'm sorry if I seem a little bit more business oriented and business heavy. That's where all of my experience has been, but a lot of the techniques we're going to talk about and some of the things we're all going to discuss are applicable across multiple platforms. On the screen, for those of you who can't see, I'm sorry, I had a little technical difficulty. I chose a handful of keywords, and not keywords like you would think that you would want to brand your website with. This is more I'm asking you as people wanting to, to know from me and wanting to learn. What is it that you're looking for? from your blog, from your online advertising campaign, from a, a pu public relations release that you want to do? Where is it that you need to market yourself online? So I chose a handful of keywords, a click-through rate. Click-through rate is the amount of people that see your site and come to your site. A conversion, well, that can be a lot of different things for a lot of people, but I think we all get the general idea of what a conversion is. Cost per acquisition, that's more of an industry term when you're talking about what's it cost for you to acquire a customer, a lead, a sale. Bounce rate, how quick has somebody left your site once they got there? That's To, to me, that's very important. Unique visitors, uh, for those of you bloggers out there, you're counting people that are being touched and embraced by your information, so that's an important statistic, I think. Engagement, Ugh. this word is starting to really burn me. <laughs> We have to start to use synonyms of engagement, collaboration, you know, working together. It, it's more of a personal aspect. I heard that in conversation last night, and that really hit home for me because to me, when you engage with somebody, you're not just going back with ones and zeros, going back with letters. You're actually giving it part of you. Um, clicks. For all of you people who are out there with a business and a, and a website, you're trying to chase clicks. And then finally, downloads. So with the small group that I have, I think we have enough time. I'm literally going to call people out and ask them what word means the most to them out of that for their specific entity. And I'll just start here. I'm Mike. How you doing? Hi. <clears throat> Becky? Yes. Very nice to meet you. I, I hate to put you on the spot, but out of those words up there, for, for what you hope to take out of this today, what word really hits home with you the most? And for you guys, pick a word. <laughs> 
Hey, maybe it's this. Um, <laughs> I would probably say conversion. All right, so let's talk about conversion. What type of site, what type of business is it that you're focusing on? Um, I'm not really focusing right now. Awesome. <laughs> so we'll associate it then to a business aspect of it. Yeah. When we talk about a conversion on an internet marketing venture, internet marketing campaign for a business, a conversion can be a lot of different things. With without anything off the top of my head, people are going to say a conversion is a lead. Anybody? Any other ideas what a conversion is? Shout out some answers. A download from your site. Converting from like a visit to actually buying something. You tell me. That's, yes. that's the opening. I mean, that's the thing. It is, if, that's, if that's what your conversion is to you, then that's great. And that's what we're going to, we can discuss ways to get that and, and, and elaborate on what it is you need to pull from that conversion. If somebody is doing a blog or running a podcast, a conversion necessarily could be something as simple as a download, where there is no real interaction. They may have picked it up and scraped it off, off of Twitter, or they may have found it on Facebook, they may have found it on YouTube, they may have had it referred to them by a friend. So, conversion is going to be a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Ultimately, what we're looking for online, then, when we talk about a conversion, is we have to be seen. People want to be able to see us. Everybody wants to be at the top of Google. I can tell you this till I'm blue in the face. Being at the top of Google doesn't matter unless you have that conversion. You can be number one all day, and people can just skip right over your ad. So they can skip right over your description. They can skip right over the, skip right over the title of your, of your page that you're trying to push out there. So in order to do this, we time tackle it in a, in a way, and Google is really evolving, and I'm going to refer to Google a lot, Google is really evolving in how they're accepting what you provide to them. Google doesn't want their first page to be jumped up with a bunch of big companies that have a ton of money that they can throw out just to buy the position. Google wants quality content. So when you're picking your title of the page that you want people to find, you don't want to pick a general specific or a general broad topic. You want a very specific topic. I find all too often too many companies try and fit too much stuff on one website. We understand that your company does a lot of different things, but they all don't need to be together when you're marketing yourself. You need to individualize these different pages, these different services, these different campaigns. You need to get them out there on their own. And I, I, I can only take from personal experience uh, a great example is I work with a law firm, and they obviously have many different practice areas. Their home page has all of their practice areas on it. Their home page is also the page that has the biggest bounce rate, the least click-through rate, and, and there's a, a failure to convert there. But for some reason, everyone thinks that needs to be where you're going to make your conversion. Let's get our phone number at the top of our home page. Let's get calls to action. Let's get conversion points there. I mean, they're trying to sell you around every turn. Google's starting to go away from that now because they realize that the customer experience is being jaded. So you're start, they're losing real estate. They're losing the ability to make money. And that's what they want. They want people to come back to their search engine. So when you're talking about content and how to segregate it, how to individualize what your company's doing, you have the guts and tell them, we need to break these off into separate, separate microsites. And at first, you're going to hit a wall. They're, they don't want to ever hear the word rebuild. They don't want to spend the money on it. But what they really want, they have no choice in, in the end on how to get there. All right, for lack of time here, I want to... Next word. Um, leads. All right, keeping on with our, our topic, what we're talking about in leads to conversions, companies have different kinds of leads. You know, some companies don't have any leads, and some companies have too many leads. When I, when I think of leads from an internet marketing standpoint, I think there's a lot of honesty that has to come from the company itself. And first of all, what is a lead to them? And I can tell you that 80% of all companies are going to count a lead as a phone call. After that, they're going to look at an email, but all importantly, a lead to them is a live person that they can get their pitch to. I mean, that's what they train all these salespeople to do is sell, sell, sell. You need the phone call to get, to get the lead. But generating the lead isn't essentially the conversion. Because just because somebody calls me for my business or calls me for my services doesn't mean that they're going to turn into a client. People detach themselves from the sales aspect of online advertising because they get too caught up in that pay-per-click, in that number one on Google aspect. Once people start calling you, are you aptly able to handle what's coming in? I use an example of a day spa that I did business with. You know, I generated phone calls for her, and ultimately, people were calling and saying, hey, do you do seaweed facials? No. Like, well, you know... <laughs> 
she says to me, Mike, this marketing isn't working. You know, I don't, I don't have any business. And I'm like, well, let's wait a second. Fortunately for me, I, you know, working with the company, I, we were able to record phone calls for call tracking because an ultimate, you know, accountability is is where you actually have to point a finger in the end of the day. Marketing is pretty mathematical. Somebody's at blame. You know, there's some weak link in the chain. So what I said to her was, instead of saying no to the people that are calling you, ask them what it is about that product that they like. And then you should be as intimate with your inventory as anybody to be able to sell them a comparable product and maintain that warm relationship and then take that lead to a conversion. Good segue. I like that. Remains <laughs> <laughs> engaged. All right. Great word, collaboration. Um, <laughs> You know, this this is something I, I, I really think, and I said, I said to the tweet about this, I really think a lot of the, some of the better information that's shared in a pod camp comes in the intimate conversations that occur in, on, and around sessions. Because it's kind of like a hands-down thing. So last night I got into a bunch of conversations with a bunch of different pod people about <laughs> engagement. And it's an interesting con concept because what is engagement for you? I think it's people visiting the site and for me, like from a blogging perspective, posting, keeping a conversation going, and then I think it's going to comments. I think it's going to, I think it's going to bring people back, and by them commenting, they're going to take that back and say, "Hey, look what I found." So it's going to be almost word of mouth advertising. You, you bring up a very good point about engagement, and engagement isn't an initial reaction. It isn't an initial meeting. It's not a handshake. It's not a phone call. Engagement is a long-tailed situation. Ask to people that are married. <laughs> Started off with an engagement. Um, in all honesty, it's not something that has an end immediately. And unfortunately, in internet marketing, people foresee and understand an engagement as a phone call, a click, a lead, a forum, maybe somebody even just visiting their website. So I really appreciate the, the breath of freshness you put out there to let people know that there is actually more involved to an engagement online. And when you're running an advertising campaign online, if you have the type of business that can attract that engagement, if you can actually put real content that people will engage with. And what I mean by this is everybody wants a video on their website. Everybody wants to put a video somewhere. You can, I'll tell you where you can put a video. <laughs> because of what I've seen, in the, and I've worked in multiple industries, people are not going to sit and watch a 30 second video. They want their web page in three seconds. They're scanning the top two seconds of your website and then they're gone if they don't find something they want. I challenged a guy one time to give me a video that's actually engaging. It was like a minute and a half long. I mean, you're not going to sit there. What do you come away with? There's no, no takeaway for it when I, when I talk about these types of engagements. So, you know, video engagement used to be a good thing. I think it's a lot left on the plate for video. I think we haven't touched on how video is ever going to really be a potential conversion generator, engagement generator, lead generator, or generator of any kind of business in an internet marketing arena because not everyone has time to focus on it. Unfortunately, everyone wants everything a lot faster, a lot more right now. Engagement's not a click a call. It is a long-term relationship. And if you can manage your engagement to your benefit as you develop it, you can take a sale and you can convert it from not just the first day, but the second day, the third day, that warm referral you're talking about that you get from a friend that comes and visits your site. So the potential is, is viral at that point. And managing an engagement, I think, is something that, as a company, you have to look at and say, is it valuable to us and what our product or service is? As a blogger, it's infinitely worthwhile because you want that continued experience. But honestly, 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 you have to be real with what you're providing to people. If it's not engageable, nobody is going to engage. Start with another word. Clicks. Clicks. This is the term everyone loves. Clicks. I mean, we all hear. I can't wait till they make a mouse that you don't even have to hear. Um, honestly, clicks is is a word that is more antiquated these days because I think what where our conversation has taken us to this point is we understand now that clicks are a part of engagement, are a part of conversion, and are are, are sometimes a means to a lead. So generating clicks is important. It's kind of like standing in the middle of traffic. You know, you're going to get hit eventually, but that's not what you want. You want to actually be able to open the door, open a window, and talk to people that are coming past you. That way you can get your brand, your service, or your product out to them and engage them. So when I talk about clicks, 
we'll, we'll focus on one I started off with, which was PPC. Foolproof way to get clicks. I mean, you're paying for placement on a search engine. I'll talk a little bit about pay-per-click in the fact that I'm jaded because I work for a company that uses something called a results-oriented bid management system. They work. Ultimately, what this company did is they wrote a computer program that looked at a keyword and said, what have you done for me lately? Do I need to pay for the number one position if I've only gotten two out of 10 leads or clicks or conversions? No, the word's not doing anything to convert business for me, so why would I bid to a higher position just for nothing? Let me manage my cost per click and put myself maybe at number four. The number four position in pay-per-click advertising is generally at the top of the right-hand column. And as any of you as marketers out here may know, or any of you who actually pay attention to Google may know, they're manipulating us. They are, are toying with our minds. I love them, I use them, I support them, but they are smart. And what I mean by this is we all know the ad, the pay-per-click ads and the, the sponsored ads at the top of Google, right? How do we all recognize them? Anybody? Come on. I know they you guys have seen them. Color block. They have a different color background, right? They had a yellowish kind of, I don't even know, lilac or not lilac, like a daisy yellow. It was very light. Over the past five years, they've removed a hexadecimal of color from it each year. Now that yellow that was back there in 2008, it's almost transparent at this point. They've taken their pay-per-click ads and they've removed the segregating background. They've widened the space that they take up. We're used to clearly be able to segregate a paid ad from a, a natural and organic listing. Google has actually widened the ability for the page, where the, where the words sit on the page. Not only have they done that, and this by far is the most deviant point that I see from Google, They've expanded the white space below the search box at the top of the page and the top of the first paid result. By such a minuscule amount, it was unrecognizable to you because as you got your Google delivered to you, it just came a little bit further down, a little bit further down, a little bit further down. Then they made the paid ads a little bit bigger, a little bit wider. They faded to color. So now a customer, a potential client, a blogger, or anybody that's coming to your site is looking for you online. There's hardly a difference now to tell who's in the paid arena for their clicks and who's in the natural and organic arena for their clicks. Pay-per-click is a foolproof way to generate clicks to your site. In addition to pay-per-click, I'm going to say a word that, I mean, I've made, I've made my livelihood on this for a while now, but it's actually a word that's starting to fade out, and that's SEO. Um, for those who don't know SEO, search engine optimization, before it was search engine optimizer, before it was the name of a person or a title of a, of a marketing department, SEO really was about people manipulating the ability to rank themselves highly on Google. And I, I can't tell you any more besides that is the most pure, honest answer you'll get. There was no other science, method, madness to generating and building a website in the search engine optimization arena than manipulation of the facts, of the code, you know, everything you knew to try and get yourself ahead of the next guy who was manipulating it the same way you were. It's not like that anymore. You can't go out and submit your website to submit my URL and get 500 free links and expect yourself to shoot to the top of Google. You can't take a whole bunch of keywords and turn them into the same color as your background, stick them at the bottom of your page and hope that's gonna generate traffic to your website. You can't make the titles and the wording of your pages so robotic that the name of your company is the University of Maryland University College. I mean, that's a key, that's a keyword heavy, we get it, we know what you are trying to do. And, and what Google has really done to the search engine optimization community is kind of just like cut it off at the knees. You're gonna hear terms in the industry, you're gonna hear Panda, living in a post-Panda world. Panda was the name given to an algorithm change on Google that helped to start to cut out people that were doing these deviant sort of black hat marketing techniques. You're gonna hear Penguin. Penguin was a real bad one. April 24th, a lot of people woke up that morning, went through Google Analytics and saw a drop. April 24th, check your analytics. If you have a drop in search that day, you were a victim of the Penguin update. Penguin update for me was one that hit home. I was picking up a mess from a law firm I was working at and unfortunately the client they had before or the marketer they had before me bought links. And Google recognized it immediately. Chop, there you go. Dropping from the top five in the search results in Pittsburgh to not even on the fifth page. Penguin was a tough update, and what they really looked for were people that were trying to buy links or buy their way and backdoor their way into a search engine position. At the same time, that's when Google first rolled out their first over optimization penalty, right? 
what kind of what kind of clarification does that give me? What's over optimizing? What Google ended up saying, and I, I say Google because I, I have a good relationship with a gentleman by the name of Matt Cutts, who is a programmer and developer for Google Spam. He essentially is the one that controls all of these updates because it's his job to keep it pure and simple on the homepage. And what he basically said was he was looking for unnatural text. He was looking for people who were putting too many Pittsburgh, Pennsylvanias at the beginning of their page title and at the end. He was looking for people who were saying the words lawyers and attorneys in the same sentence. I mean, this is the kind of over-optimization that he was really trying to hit home about and purify. So the Penguin update may not have been a link update. If you can't find links on your site that are, are this essentially bad links or, or from link farms, and you're wondering what happened to you, I tell you, go back and start to read your, your writings on your pages like a human. Not because you're writing it for a search engine, but write it for a human. Write it for somebody who can be conversational and you can understand what it means because that's going to start to pay off now with search engine optimization, which is going to get you more clicks. Walked in late, we're yeah. taking words off the board. Oh, stop. What word means the most to you, your business, or your brand? I'd say conversion. We already had conversion. <laughs> We've had conversion, click, engagement. Good unique visitors. Good. I love unique visitors, right? This is a this is an in your face statistic. This one's easily found on Google Analytics. This is what this is what you don't want your bosses to see when you give them the report because this is where the fluff comes to the push. What I mean by that is you get a, you get a number off of Google that says how many clicks to your website you had. Wait a second, I love this. This is easy. You know, everyone that's stuck on this, I want traffic. They associate it to clicks. Obviously, that's how you open the website. So they they look at how many people click to your website, and that gives. And you can talk to your blue in the face to your business owners. You can talk to your blue in the face to to your people that run your blogs. They want clicks. They want traffic. That's what that's what the gauging aspect is to them. They understand. They know what the phone needs to ring, and they know that they need engagement. They need downloads or, or some kind of you know readership. But ultimately, they're checking those clicks. That number means the most to any CEO that I've ever met in my life. They want to know. Well, how many clicks are you getting a month? Does it matter? How many phone calls am I getting that's generating money for the company? So you can have this boat. <laughs> um, Unique visitors is the, is the statistic that enables you to see, out of those clicks, how many of them were just unique people, not repeat offenders. And that's, repeat offenders are good. We talked about engagement before. We want people coming back. But in, as an honest online advertiser, you really have to be able to identify how many new faces you're touching. You don't need to keep selling the same people if that's, your, if that's what your goal is. You know, if you're selling a product or a service, repeat business is good. But you don't want to see the same person 15 times on the same page unless they're buying, you know, ink or toner. But you know, ultimately, you want these people to be in a separate group because you want to give the new person a different experience, and you're giving to the person that's been back to you before. And I'm going to go at this again and say that companies overwhelmingly give the same person, everybody, the same experience. I've, I've come very few and far between to find people that are able to segregate a unique visitor and a, and a unique uh, website experience to the two different groups of the general versus the return shopper. I mean, is there a special door you walk in if I've been here before? No, because a lot of people that now are, are, are familiar with your URL, familiar with what keyword they can type in quickly to get to your website. And I, I think part of the, the situation, I mean, I wish I could tell you that there was a special dust we could sprinkle on the website to do this, but I mean, I ultimately want to know who's been to my site before and who hasn't. Because if you've been here, you have an anticipation. So you don't need to cut through the first one and a half pages of BS. You've been BS. You need to get to the meat. So I would say for a unique visitor in an online advertising experience, you really want to be able to treat them as unique and new. And you want to give them that same relationship opportunity to feel new. And for people who are returning customers and returning visitors to your website, you almost want to cater to them in a different manner because you know they're there for a different reason. They've, been, they've had your pitch before. They've been to your homepage. And I, I, we'll talk a little bit more about you know deviating different products, brands, and services from your website and establishing a microsite. All right, let's start back here now with the next word. Uh, downloads. Downloads. This is very, very important here at PodCamp because PodCamp started about podcasting. Download is a term. I'm going to go back again to a more antiquated interpretation of what a download is anymore. 
I mean, in all honesty, like, what do we really download? We download updates. If you're a PC user, you download security updates constantly. Um, we'll download music. But in, on a marketing for a, a business, what do you take away from a download? I can tell you from my company, the downloads we have to offer are our great video. The downloads we have to offer is our propaganda in the form of a PDF. And the other downloads we have are, companies don't realize that they can prolong the engagement with some kind of a useful download. Almost like a map to the doorway of being that next repeat customer. Because once you leave, what's your only way back? If I want you to get to my site a different way, I have to IKEA you around. And there are some people that sneak around IKEA. I've seen them. They cut who follow their path. <laughs> if, I want, if, I want, if I want somebody to get to a different part of my website than from my homepage, I have to give them the ability to get there. I have to force them there, and I can't do it by saying, go here now, with a little clicking GIF file with a blinking to it, you know? So I, I look to this download as maybe a possibility where we can really step through the, the second level of our engagement and bring that person back as the ability to do so. How do we do it, right? What, what, what's popping off the heads here for, for abilities to, to bring that person back to a download? Well, how about a follow-up email with a new URL attached to it? And that URL is giving them the ability to go to a different part of your website. Now, your homepage is still there, but they don't need your homepage. They need the second layer of, 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 the, of the site. They need a more embraced experience because they've been there before. At the same time now, if you're going to email that download to them, we're opening up a whole other door to email marketing. One that I'm not as familiar with because I've never really big a, been a big proponent for it. To me, email marketing has been, <laughs> we had a conversation last night about junk mail. You know, when we first, everyone wanted mail back in the day. When the guy bought the horse around, you wanted mail. Now nobody wants mail. Or is it now that mail has become chic again, so I want to read my mail. I think it's been a cycle all along there. But I'm not going to touch a lot about email marketing. However, Reaching out to your return customers and extending your engagement through email marketing is the right tool for the right place. I mean, that's you use a hammer to put in a nail. You can't bang a screw in with a hammer I've tried. So for me, email marketing has a, a, a place and works well in that repeat arena because it's almost like an opt-in. When you go to the airline, you know, you tell you tell Air Train you want them or discount if you ever look at them, not unless you're flying that week. So, I mean, you, you recognize the name, it gets past your first personal level of security, and if it makes its way out of your spam folder, then it's something that you may actually be able to engage. But the download doesn't have to be just an email. The download can be so much more. I mean, this is PodCamp, right? Let's talk about social media. These downloads that people can take from your website can be simple. It may be like a, uh, a tweet going to them with a follow-up that says, hey, you know, check this out. Come to our site and look at this. I mean, I, I can't pinpoint and say what product or what service because there's so many different ones here. But ultimately what I'm trying to get at is don't leave your download on your website because no one's going to come and find it. I mean, it's it doesn't have a special little blinking sign that says, come download me now. And people aren't going to realize the value of that because you're not giving it a value. You know, if I had to search for a download on, my, on a site that I don't really need, that's not good marketing. I mean, I'm not applying it to a specific need or even look, giving it the Respect to say you deserve a, a separate approach, a separate campaign. Your, your downloads, in my opinion, for internet marketing, need to be more geared specifically towards a unique visitor, a repeat visitor, or a very specific product or service that you're going to offer to them that may be applicable to something they've done in the past. You're going to get more from it that way with a download. Now, podcasters, I, I, I ask you this honestly because this is more of a question I have. My experiences with podcasting are antiquated. You know, I remember when you used to have to download a podcast to watch it. It's my understanding that these kids have made these things nowadays <laughs> where you can just watch it and not have to download it. So I think the term download has really been dissolved down to maybe something that, unless you're using it as a tool for a specific service, doesn't have as much meaning to us anymore outside of the music, the security updates, you know, the phone updates, that's where we download the crap out of stuff on our phone. And, you know, mobile advertising, it's interesting because 
mobile advertising is an industry and a forum that you really, you can't lie to yourself. You can't BS yourself. You have to say, am I really going to convert somebody on a phone? And for lawyers who I work with, they are they're, they drank the milk, man. They think that they're going to convert every person they've ever met in their lives on their phone. And out of this, out of the thousands of people I know that we've reached, I can't tell you one phone call we've gotten from it, and it's money that I don't want to spend, but they make me spend. If you're going to take any type of campaign, it's going to focus on downloading online, and then you're going to enable it to be mobile. The experience has to be congruent with that on your website, because mobile is changing so fast. And I'll, I'll be a little more detail about this. When you go to your website, you have the full pretty picture. You get all that work, all those approved images, everything's there. Your form, everything's very easy to go. There's a, that, that landing page was made for a reason. Well, they don't teach landing page creation for a 740 by 900 screen because most people can't see that small to understand what's going on around them. So what you see is a mobile version that's a bunch of bars on screen that you choose with a topic on them. Not as engageable, right? I don't get that warm and fuzzy experience when I use any mobile site. So what I've seen happening on, with the mobile advertising is people are immediately jumping ship from the mobile version of their phone because, or mobile version of their site because they realize that they're not going to get a nice, a nice transition, a nice look that they want because you just can't. We're talking small, but I mean, I guess it's Apple goes mini and, and Samsung goes bigger. So it's going to be like this six and a half inch device that we're all going to be able to see perfectly you know, optimize for that size when they come out. But you really have to ask yourself, what is it you're trying to offer these people from that point? You know, where is your engagement? Where is your click through? Where is, is your lead coming from there? And with the, with the mobile environment changing and, and not being able to be, you know, kind of digested, do I buy from here? People hear security problems, you know, can you steal my stuff out of the air? I don't really push for the mobile aspect. I, I'd love to, to run a campaign personally for a company and watch it be successful on a mobile on a mobile campaign, just on a phone, because I'd like to be able to, to understand how and why. But from my experience this far, the mobile arena has been very touchy, and you have to have a very specific product or service to push out on there. But for podcasting, I think it's an essential tool in your digital toolbox because you don't know where that engagement point is going to occur. Because what are the things we're doing on our phones? Watching videos, looking at pictures. I can't read a website on a phone, but I can watch a video. <laughs> You know, and, and so with that said, podcasting and, and you know, video on the phones is, is easily digested. It's supported widely, mostly, except for Apple. They don't make really. it. Um, so I, I say that make sure that the tool is the right fit for the digital, for the download on the mobile aspect. Any thoughts about that? Nope. All right. Next word. How about bounce rate? Bounce rate, my favorite word. I love bounce rate. When you tell a company about bounce rate, they look at you like you're crazy. They don't even know what this means. They've never even heard of this. But to me, this is one of the most important statistics you can look at to get a full idea of how well your website's working and how well your website's allowing people to click, allowing people to engage, allowing people to end up in a sale and download. Bounce rate's a very simple statistic. Google loves to give it to you. People look at it. And so a lot of people have a great understanding of it, but ultimately bounce rate says, hey, I've come to your site, I'm here, do I like it? Nope, I'm leaving. Bounce rate's not just that jaded. Bounce rate also could be you put yourself in the wrong arena. You're marketing yourself to the wrong demographic of people. I mean, one of the things that I take away from a bounce rate immediately when I look at it is I want to see, it, is the page individual? Is the page geared towards one specific topic or is it like a home page? You know, I expect my home page to have a high bounce rate because People are going to get there and leave because they may have gotten there looking for car parts because there was a congruent keyword. I understand that on my home page. <laughs> but on subsequent pages on your website, they're specifically geared to your product or service. A bounce rate is important because that tells them how well they're digesting the information on that page. It tells them if the information is even pertinent to what they were looking for. And it also lets you know, you know, how pretty is my page? Is it put together correctly? Bounce rate is important because it ultimately tells you if you're able to prolong the engagement. So after you start to look at your bounce rate of your pages, and this is, you'll honestly, you'll be shocked, you'll see uh, who I think is a good bounce rate. I have one website I'm running right now where my bounce rate's around 
it's a criminal defense website. I understand that some people are getting there maybe realizing that they don't have money to spend. I expect there to be a certain bounce rate. I have a separate website, and I've broken this off. I told you guys I, I work for a law firm. They have lots of practice areas. I took a website, in, or I took a practice area of theirs, which was traffic tickets and driver's licensing services. And I said, just hear me out. Let me try this with this. This is what I think is going to work for you guys. I bought a domain, licensehelp.com, geared specifically to driver's licensing services and traffic ticket lawyers. That web page on my AdWords campaign with my natural SEO and everything else I'm doing with it has a bounce rate of 1.25. That means 1% one of every people, one out of every 10 person got there by accident. Any any campaign I've ever run has never been sub three. Three was my like, new low number. I had 3% of the people leaving the site before. So bounce rate told me that I had built something that was very specific, that it was targeting the right audience, and that they were getting what they needed from those pages because they weren't leaving. They were staying. They were engaging. They were clicking. They were downloading information. They were teaching themselves. Why? Because the information that I provided to them was giving them the ability to take something away. There's three types of customers and clients in this world. There's people that'll pay you to do something for them. There's people that'll do it themselves. And then there's my favorite that's called the do it yourself for me. They'll call you and have you tell them exactly what you would do to fix the problem or to do the problem or to get to the end. And then they'll hang up with you, not buy from you. They'll go try and do it themselves. Make it worse, and then call you and haggle you about the price you want to charge to fix what you would have told me to fix in the first place. <laughs> that is the key to the engagement on a business's website. Why? Because you have to give somebody something. They're not. There. There's some industries where they need you. I mean, if my toilet's clogged, I'm calling a plumber. So I'm not going to worry about you know calling them, asking them how to unplug it. Well, I might, but you know, <laughs> and, and, and get it done. I, I'm, there's, there's, there's very A and B, black and white types of situations when it comes to online advertising. And that do it yourself for me client is the one that nine out of 10 times leads to the call coming in. Because you provide them with enough information that they realize right where they have to stop if things get professional. And that's what's good about good content is that good content gives somebody, they leave you feeling warm and fuzzy, like, hey, I got something out of this. So, I mean, a lot of the statistics you can get from Google Analytics. Yes. So, Google Analytics is, is where I pulled out a lot of these keywords because it's a free tool. It's a really good tool because, it, you know, 80%, it was higher at one point, but 80% of all online transactions occur in touching Google at some point. And Google provides the best service of all. It's free. So, when you, you look at your content on your site and, you know, you think it's good because you wrote it. But your bounce rate lets you know if your consumers, your clients, your, your downloaders think it's good. In, in, in this day and age, you have to be honest with yourself. The old school, the old school line fluff and, and marketing is, is out the door. I mean, there's no more, you know, I reach 7 million customers in my penny saver anymore. I don't care about that. I need to be able to count my dollars. I can tell every click how much money gets spent on. So bounce rate lets you know how good your content is. And I think Online advertising isn't online advertising. None of us are search engine marketers. We are all content engineers. And that is an honest to God description of what I do on a daily basis. I code websites, I build websites, but honestly when I have to focus on the marketing aspect of it, it comes down to my content. And how engageable and how real is my content. And let my bounce rate tell me how good it is. Because if I have a big bounce rate, I know right where to go first. All right, next. I'm oh, sorry. Some, some pages that were, were a high bounce rate is good. Well, there's, it's never good. <laughs> there's somewhere it's more acceptable. A home page is going to have a higher bounce rate because 90% of the time when someone submits their website to, to a search engine, to a listing, you give them your, your home domain. You give them your home page. And unfortunately, your home page is always going to be your most viewed page. I mean, if you go to Google Analytics, I've never ran a campaign where it wasn't. So, I'll accept a higher bounce rate from that page because I know that's my front door and sometimes you walk in the wrong door. So I'll accept a higher one. I'll accept something along the lines of an industry where I can tell you after you've read enough that you realize it's going to cost you $1,500 to have me get a, a, a crime expunged off your record and you only have about 150 So I, I can understand where some industries, people don't realize what a cost is 
for a service, and then they, you get them to the website, that's fine. A, a good, a good uh, way to understand this is, I ran a marketing campaign for Hillman Appliance in Cranberry. Hillman Appliance is biking, sub-zero, you know, all high-end $5,000 appliances. I didn't use words like dent and ding, discount, you know, any, any of these sale words. You know, I tried the high-end kitchen appliances. I tried to segregate immediately so I could avoid a high bounce rate because we, they sell refrigerators, but they're $5,000. I can go to Sears and Bridgeville and get a dent and ding for a couple hundred. So that same client is the person I wanted. I wanted the, the refrigerator keyword. And I knew when I started with them, I could see their bounce rates were high because people were getting there and not realizing that the, the, the concept that they were going for wasn't what was being sold to them. So yes, there are times we'll all accept a higher bounce rate. And there's sometimes you just can't fix it. I mean, in, in law where I work, it's inevitable. I mean, people don't want to pay to have something taken away that they forgot to pay on a traffic ticket. It's going to cost them $1,500 to get that $200 ticket taken care of. So I'll accept it in that arena. Would I accept it in, let's say, a, a plumber? No. A, a carpenter? No. You know, a carpet cleaning company? No. These, you can't have high bounce rates there. You have a direct service that you're providing. If that person got there and realized it was $900 for them to clean your carpet, what were they thinking? So it, I accepted, uh, there are acceptable bounce rates to look at. I just pulled up an email from my boss. Um, he runs our website. Um, I, I do the social media marketing side of things. Um, but looking at the bounce rate, he's got it organized by state. We're a nonprofit organization. The goal is to sell memberships. Um, and our bounce rate ranges from anywhere between 45 and 85 percent. So you got to look at what you're offering those people in those different areas. And I mean, that just that lets you know right there that you're you're creating too broad of a, a idea and a concept where each of these each of these places that you're marketing to have an individualization about themselves. I mean, I'll go back to a conversation I had with somebody. Small business means something different to everybody. These words mean something different to all of you. That's why I wanted to do this format because I wanted to hear what each one of you had an idea and what it meant to you. And that's that's you know. The, the proof is a pudding. Right. Uh, the advertising online is 100% accountable. There is no gray area. There are statistics that when you look at them, you that's why I worded the title of this. You know, There's things you know that you don't know. And there's things you don't know that you know. So I mean, when I just when you have somebody else to sit back and regurgitate it to you a little bit differently, it gives you a whole new perspective. It's not like I taught you something. I just made you look at it different. All right, your word. It's getting limited. It is, uh, I guess. Well, we can go back to another one if you have questions about what we talked about. Cost per acquisition. Cost per acquisition. This one came out about five years ago and started getting real big because about eight years ago, people just got to taste of internet marketing, didn't really know what it was. I had to do more teaching than selling to even have people understand what my product was. Uh, as the consumer got more intelligent, as they were pitched by Verizon and Yellow Book and every ad agency in Pittsburgh by every business, they started to get an idea of what some of these words meant. They started to understand a little bit about, you know, enough to make them dangerous. And really, you know, that's the problem is you get a partial understanding of a concept. You think your partial understanding is correct. And then you have somebody come in who understands all of it and tells you, no, well, that's not really going to work. So... Cost per acquisition came out a little bit after the, the business owners started to understand how internet marketing worked. They understood that they were actually able to be accountable and count the money that it cost them to get a lead. Because in, in the days before internet marketing, we were paying $50,000 for a double trunk ad in, in, the new, in the newspaper. We had an ad in the yellow, or in the penny, uh, phone book, penny saver, clipper. These were ungageable medias. So what we would do is we would take a look at how much new business we had that year, how much we spent, and we'd say, well, that's our cost per acquisition. Well, cost per acquisition online has been so torn apart, detailed, regenerated, or spit back to you that it's perfect now. You get a perfect idea of what a cost per lead is, what a cost per sale. How much did that phone call cost me? I mean, you can get a clear idea of what your cost per acquisition. And to me, when I start talking about cost per acquisition in a, in a marketing arena online, I know I'm in a meeting with some bosses because they're the ones who want to know what it's costing me. And when I start to tell people, you know, everyone wants to hear that one click cost them five dollars and they didn't get anything from it. Because we start putting it in terms like that, people are realizing that I just spent five bucks and I didn't get anything out of it. 
But then you start painting a bigger picture and you tell them, well, you know what, over the course of the month, I spent $175, we generated, you know, 17 <clears throat> phone calls and new leads from that. Our cost per acquisition was $10. But even better than that was our cost per acquisition gives us a clear idea of what our profit margins are. And for me, when I tell somebody about online advertising, the first three to six months of our campaign is going to tell us if we even have a viable product. Because cost per acquisition, if it's way lopsided, if I'm spending a thousand dollars a month just to get my idea or my service out there, and I'm only charging maybe fifteen hundred to two thousand for my product, that's not a good enough profit margin because there's an overhead that we're not even talking about involved in there that you're not going to make money in. So I look at cost per acquisition as a, a way for me to gauge if I have a viable product. And, and sometimes the acquisition is a download that we've talked about. Sometimes the acquisition is a click. But the majority of the time, that acquisition has to be a lead because that's what we're trying to get. And acquisition, to me, doesn't necessarily mean sale. It means, as a marketer, that I've brought something into my company, and my company better have taken the, the proper steps to put their best salesperson to convert that. Because after that, Marketing is only as strong as the person that answers the phone. And I can preach on blue in the face to a company, have them on top of the search engines, have them with the greatest cost per acquisition, have them with the lowest bounce rate, with the most clicks. But it all comes back to that one engagement point of that phone call with that sales rep. And is it a hot call? Is it a cold call? You know, or is the person being rigid on the other end? Is the person being informative? So to me, a cost per acquisition in online marketing is going to tell me, first of all, if I have a viable product that I'm going to make a profit at. And it also gives me the ability to elaborate to the higher ups, which are going to ask about a cost per acquisition. And if you are that higher up, it's an understanding that I'm going to present to you that there's a lot more information that comes into play with this cost per acquisition. I am, next word. I don't know. We're starting to run out of time here. Um, now what's left? Um, hmm. That's great. All right, so the last one we have, and we are running out of time, is click-through rate. This is another one of those statistics that I love. I love the click-through rates on my site. Why? Because the click-through rate, first of all, is more of, I'll talk about it in two arenas. I'll talk about it in a paid aspect first. Click-through rate in a paid arena, meaning on an online advertising campaign, general, generally using pay-per-click advertising techniques, is going to tell me, is my ad good? The click-through rate is going to tell me, first of all, it's a, it's a relationship, it's a ratio between the number of people that saw your ad and the number of people that came through your website, clicked through your ad, and, and came in. And this goes, I'll use the Hillman analogy again. The click-through rate for me was very important when I was running that campaign because what it gave me the ability to do was look and see if the ad fit. I mean, the bounce rate was going to tell me if I got them there, but the click-through rate gave me a statistic even before my bounce rate. The click-through rate gave me the ability to understand if people were even getting to my site first. Because the first thing you have online is your ad on pay-per-click or your title and description in SEO, Natural and Organic Arena. If you're not getting a click-through rate, then your initial presentation that you're offering to clients isn't on par. What you need to look at is you need to look at, am I using the right words? Am I using too general words? I mean, there are some words online that will really kill a click-through rate. And I, I tell you that anytime you want to add a geo modifier, meaning like a city name or a state, to your click to your ad online, you really want to be careful of what you're adding. I had a, a situation recently where the word Washington came into play. Well, unfortunately, there's how many Washingtons? But my company was in Washington. I needed them to be able to get traffic to Washington, PA. But when we're looking at how I wrote the ad, you know, I had written, you know, Washington, personal injury attorney. Well, people from Washington State, people from Washington St. Louis, people from, you know, all of a sudden I knew every Washington in the country. So the click-through rate gave me the ability to say that I knew my initial presentation that I was offering clients online wasn't on par with what they were looking for. And it, it gives you the ability to tinker a little bit, you know, and figure out where these buzzwords are that are helping people to come through to your website. With the information that you look at in your ad online or your title or your description, and looking at your click-through rate, it gives you a foundation to build successful convertible web content further down the line because what worked out front is going to work back again. You're going to have that same idea. So if you see the word discount, sale, and ding in your ad and you're getting click-throughs for it, don't be a site that's high-end. Get them to that sale. Get them to that dent and ding. Give them what they came in for. 
So click-through rate gives me the ability on my advertising campaign, whether it's natural or paid, to tell me, am I attracting the right bees with the right honey? All right, we, I think we're out of words. Are there any words that we didn't talk about that people may have questions about that mean something to them that they wanted to elaborate on? Search engine optimization. Well, we can talk about it maybe after. <laughs> Yeah, that's not a short one, but I mean, ultimately, I, I mentioned this before. To me, the term search engine optimization is pretty much dead. Optimize meant manipulate. I mean, I don't care how you shake it. Optimize was manipulation. You were being a search engine manipulator. They didn't like that. Search engines fight you on that tooth and nail. And this is the funny part. Google sends out a penguin algorithm change or a panda algorithm change, watches the statistics on your site fluctuate. And how do they find out who's being deviant or not? Because they just go back and wait to see who made all these changes to their site to get it back up to the top again. I mean, it's a pretty clear cut and dry that if I'm cheating, I'm gonna have to cut off the part that I'm cheating with to get ahead. I can't keep cheating. They're gonna recognize that and you're not gonna get any further. So Google actually had a lot of, a, a, a pretty good move when they did these algorithm changes because what they said to them was, we're gonna identify immediately who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong and it was simple because people that didn't know they were doing anything wrong to begin with, that just were pure internet providers, internet content engineers, didn't even know what half this stuff was. The people that were sitting there that are called SEOers and search engine marketers were spinning in their wheels, turning in their graves, burning up because all of a sudden, everything they had been taught their whole life with manipulation of online advertising just got thrown out the window. Any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, guys, thank you very much. My name's Michael, and if you want to talk any more about any of this, I'll be around. <laughs>